ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Conspiracy Farm, where we don't start the conspiracies, we just add the water. And now, your host of the most state-of-the-art, most informed podcast on the interweb, I present to you, Pat Militage and Jeffrey Wilson. Greetings and salutations, ladies and gentlemen. Back at you one more again for another episode of The Conspiracy Farm. Unfortunately, I am not riding shotgun with UFC Hall of Famer this evening. He is in the middle of a hectic move and is uh, taking care of that right now. And he, of course, will be back with me riding shotgun. But tonight, ladies and gentlemen, to say, I mean, this is truly one of my favorite human beings on the planet. Meeting this man has, you know, literally changed the, the course of my life and the quality of my life and my understanding of who we are and all of this stuff. He's just a, a diligent, diligent researcher. My brain is just always bleeding anytime we talk or after the shows because it's just so full of information. Of course, not ri- literally bleeding. I mean, I just love his research. I love this subject. He's quite the savant on ancient cultures, ancient civilizations, ancient cuneiforms, you know, where we've come because you don't know where you're at until you know where you're going. He's, like, again, awesome researcher, incredible author. He's the author of The Illusion of Us as well as his most recent work, The Stage of Time, www.thestageoftime.com. Go check it out, as well as the host of Mastermind Discussions. And he's working on a new book with the great Billy Carson, which we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. Matthew LaCroix, thank you for joining us. How are we doing, sir? It's great to be here, Jeffrey. I love sitting down for these discussions. And let me just say, I really appreciate all those incredibly kind things you said. Um, You're one of my favorite people to work with that I've ever um, had the pleasure. Well, and I appreciate it. The pleasure is totally mine. And, you know, it was quite serendipitous how we came together. And, you know, we uh, we announced your book, The Stage of Time, not too long ago. And I'm, I'm sure it's doing well, ladies and gentlemen, if you really want to really have your mind blown check out the the, both the illusion of us and the stage of time it gives you such insight into like i said where we've come from and you know i've said many a times and learning a lot of your work as well as graham hancock and and uh russell uh, randall carlson everything is just getting older and older and uh you've really obviously been working but you know talk to us a little bit what you've been about what you've been up to my friend we haven't talked in a little bit yeah i know we've we've been busy both of us (laughs) yes Um, i I certainly have had a lot of things happen recently that are pretty exciting. Um, for those who don't follow me, some of this um, will be all new. And so those who do, some of this um, will be recent um, announcements. But some pretty neat things have happened um, over the last few weeks. Um, I had Billy Carson, another researcher that I, I work with quite a bit that you also know, um, who came up to Maine to visit me. And the reason he came up here is because we wanted to discuss a, a further collaboration. And so Billy came up and we uh, ended up traveling out to uh, this island off of the coast of Portland and sat down and had this great discussion. And that shows up for anyone who's interested. But one of the important things that came out of that meeting was that Billy and Billy Carson and I got to sit down for a good amount of time and really lay out this plan for how we would be able to collaborate. The most effective thing we could do was to write another book. So we will be releasing a book at some point in 2021 that is going to be called The Epic of Humanity. And what we wanted to do here is we wanted to bring the entire story, our story, to this compilation where him and I are going to break up each chapter, each right one, in this sequential order of understanding this entire story and this path we've gone down. Everything from the ancient influences of these sky gods— that, we, that the Sumerians called the Anunnaki, all the way up into looking at these anomalies of the solar system, submerged cities, um, ancient texts. This, this is going to be a compilation that will hopefully preserve an enormous amount of, of knowledge and information that is in some ways disappearing today. Yeah. You know, you and I have sat down with um, Sam Tripoli and talked about places in, you know, in the Middle East, in Syria. Um, Palmyra, looking at the, the the ancient columns that had these beautiful designed buildings that are all gone. They're destroyed from ISIS coming through. So we can't pretend that all of these important places and these texts are going to remain forever. Yeah. All it would take is one of these, you know, museums to have some disaster occur and then we could lose all of them. So we're yeah. going to be putting in here an enormous amount of ancient texts. Yeah, I mean, it is so very interesting, and it's kind of interesting, you know, thinking about today, not to go too deep into it, but, you know, discussions of taking down certain statues that we don't like, which essentially equates to erasing history. 
you know, if you don't like it, again, we can have that discussion if we want to legally and, and democratically or whatever the term is, have those removed, but put them in a museum somewhere. We can't just lose history because as we've talked about in your work, we see the ramifications of what it's like to lose the history of who we are, where we really came from, because then we wind up creating this other narrative that really doesn't really give us the full understanding, like, you know, almost like you, what you're talking about, these places that are disappearing, whether it's whether it's Eridu or, or any of these places, Parasopolis, et cetera. These things are so very crucial to hold on to. And that's why I love your work and it, it, Billy's as well and Graham Hancock. It just gives you such a deeper insight that, um, I mean, once you kind of, through your work and others' work, find an understanding who we really are, it really helps you understand why they're doing what they're doing because they want us to be ones and zeros and just mindless consumers that trample each other for goods on Black Friday when in fact our real reality is we are infinite conscious awareness, you know, kind of living this life through this this temporary avatar. And it goes on and on. But again, the removal of history is so, so very dangerous. That's why, you know, you guys doing this work of reviving this information, reviving these civilizations – and, and giving the, the true understanding through objective research, it's game-changing stuff, ladies and gentlemen. It truly is. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your enthusiasm uh, about this subject. You're always uh, so interested in learning about this, whereas a lot of others uh, will get little pieces of it and they may reject it or they may lose interest eventually and not just not be a very big part of their life. But you always come back and you add another layer of understanding. And I'm, yeah. I'm always impressed um, with what you gain because – you definitely have amassed a, a very knowledgeable background of this of these subjects, and I appreciate that because what it is um, is it, you nailed it on the head. This isn't about just learning about some dusty past because it's interesting. It has the answers to nearly everything. Mm -hmm. It is essentially like relearning about this lost part of who we really are. What where are what are places in the in the in the stars in the universe and what made us who we are because right now we have these this very um this very linear and uh i guess antiquated version of of how we perceive ourselves here and i think i don't i, don't, I just got through actually finishing up um getting down to, down to the bottom of the first chapter of the new book that mm -hmm. we're going to be writing and i at the end of it i was just talking about how to me the saddest part when you go through these ancient texts and you learn about you know, you learn about the myth of Adapa and how it mentions that, you know, he was created as the perfect sentient being that was was essentially the, the Anunnaki, the greatest among them. Yes. But he was even it even actually states that he was uh, in some ways greater than them. And that's that's us. You know, we may have come a long way since then. We may have lost a lot of things. There may have been aspects that we no longer ha have abilities and in certain in intellectual things and, and even longevity of life, but we're still that same being. Right. And when you read those texts, they talk about this greatness, this, inc this supreme greatness. And that's why there's been such, so much conflict and so much deception and darkness here. It's not merely because we're left alone in the middle of some dark corner of the universe, just to fend for ourselves, Like, you know, a bunch of stray dogs all fighting in a cage. We are like a great theater show for where this incredible being could go. And that's really what we are. We are like this creator being. Think about it this way. Let's say you're sitting out on a, in a field and it's a beautiful day and there's no distractions and you come up with an idea just out of nowhere. And you're like, I want to go build that or, or make it. And you do it, and you're the first one to ever do it. You just created something out of nothing. That's how we're creators. Right. We have the ability to create essentially anything we want and turn into anything we want. And yet we're, we're considered and, and viewed in many ways and conditioned for our entire lifetime that essentially our lives and what we contribute don't really matter. It's more of us just being workers and you know living this like – fantasy life of having a giant house and <laughs> certain amount of kids. And then, you know, we grow old and we have lots of smiles and then we, we, we die. And, but then the person, you know, at the edge of their deathbed is often looking back and, you know, they're really happy about some of their accomplishments, but in some ways they really feel like they didn't do a lot of the things they wanted to do. Yeah. They didn't really get pushed intellectually to think way outside the box and perceive the universe. They didn't they didn't get a chance to really get to that higher level of themselves. And that's what the ancients tell us. 
that we have fallen from this period of being a great being of, you know, a descendant of some supreme uh, deity being or God, whatever you want to call it, that came here and, and influenced us. And yet, like you said, the great sadness to me and the tragedy is looking at the state of our world and what we become and them all not most of them not realizing who we really are and, and how significant we are. Well, and a part of that is, you know, a lot of this social conditioning and you brought it up a lot of times, you know, this this autopilot that we find ourselves in almost from the time we're adults to the time we die. We're, you know, like you said, everything is based off of, you know external means have a house have a car have a job and then you know like Eckhart Tolle says we so often define ourselves by our life situation as opposed to our life which like I said you know we are infinite conscious awareness but we're just almost conditioned to stay in this autopilot and you brought it up many times I mean I lived in Chicago people in California you see the 101 or the People do that every day. They wake up to just sit in traffic, go to work, come home, sit in, before you know, sit in traffic to come home, maybe chill for an hour or two, and just do it over and over and over and over again. That's not the. I mean, that's not life. That's not living life. And I think it's important that we need to find that balance of of making a living and, and living life. Because, like you said, unfortunately, it's oftentimes once we're at the end, we're like, you know what, that didn't quite do it for me. And we can get into the whole reincarnation process and how we do come back until we get to that certain level, but. You know, in this life we have right now, I think it's so very important that we do find the time to dig deeper and, and don't malign people like yourself or myself who are digging deeper, who find who are finding out things about the Anunnaki and deciphering ancient cuneiform that definitely, you know, from your Sumerian Kings list to, like you said, Adapa and all of it. I mean, it just it just it illustrates a, a whole history and civilization and technology and ways of being that we just have no clue of now because it's been hidden from us deliberately. Yeah, it's it's such a tragedy to me. Um, and for those who don't know, you know, what, you know, what are we talking about? What are cuneiform tablets? What are what are any of these things? There is an entire different side of history that is really not taught in in, in our history books. You know, you get a little blurb about the Sumerians being the first ones that had figured out how to brew beer, and and that's literally some of. The, I actually went and read one just because I wanted to see it, and it mentions things like that. Okay, that's yeah. that's great. You know, they they learn how to brew beer, and oh yeah, they know they know how to um, grow agriculture and different types of methods for using rivers to irrigate land and all those things. But we're not told all the other things. Like for instance, they're the first ones to come up with mathematics. Right. They're the first ones to come up with astronomy, but not just having astronomy. They literally completely mapped the entire solar system. There's a cylinder seal called VA two forty three. That is an exact replica of our entire solar system. So what we're told is that this this is the first civilization that emerged out of the Fertile Crescent and just happened to decide <laughs> to stop being hunters and gatherers and, and turn into this sophisticated civilization. And every single thing that humanity developed on every single level, and I mean every level, from mathematics all the way to having the different laws of a society and how you have commerce, the first currency, um, learning about the, our solar system, learning about our earth, learning about everything came from the Sumerians. Right. And the craziest thing is they don't say that they're the ones who came up with it. They tell us this incredible story that goes back so much farther than we've ever been told. And I think that's where that this is going to, this show is going to go into it first is we're going to, well, we're going to answer that question. How far back does it go? Yeah. And, you know, how are we going to how can we retell this story correctly? And there's no accident when the you know Iraq war started, you know, one of the first places that were hit with the libraries of antiquity, because I think they know, you know, a lot of these wars we're seeing, especially in Syria and Iraq are, are archaeological wars. And I mean, of course, they don't tell you that. But, um, you know, I, I, in my opinion, and Matt and, you know, Randall Carlson, I mean, going back, ice core samples, et cetera, like these these um, cuneiforms say things have come and gone many of times. Civilizations have come and gone many times over the several hundred thousand years. And recently you have comprised an incredible timeline going back uh, 200,000 years. Dip into that for us. Hook us up with, with that timeline you've been working so hard on. Okay. Um, and just for those who are interested – this timeline that I'm about to go over, in fact, you could go right now and pull it up and look at it while I'm talking. It probably would be very helpful. Uh, if you go to the stageoftime.com, you can find my timeline there. Because what I wanted to do is not just make this boring timeline that's got a bunch of dates on and a bunch of names. I added uh, 
actual images for these tablets, what they look like, where they're placed, um, some of the images of the pyramids. And tr I try to create something that is visually appealing, but also allows people to grasp where all these things place. That was the number one question I kept getting all the time when people would email me through my website and various th uh, messages. They would ask me, where does this fall? I, I, I'm really confused. Was this before this great deluge of the Younger Dryas and disaster set of catastrophes, or was this after? And I, I would I kept answering so many different people, and eventually a couple people started to ask me, you know, you really should make a timeline. And so I spent a couple months really going through all of the uh, evidence and the data that I had from these little hints and clues in places like cuneiform tablets, which we'll go over what those are in a minute, and in any other kinds of ancient texts, and also in, in using logical um, analysis of, like what you said, ice core samples, looking at climate periods, taking basically every factor we can to try to piece together this lost past. Because what we need to understand, like uh, Jeffrey alluded to, is our Earth has gone through great cycles of catastrophes when in, uh, enormous amounts of life have been wiped off the planet. And some people might really have trouble grasping that. But we got to really look at the different time periods with the lens of, okay, this show that I'm on right now, talking to Jeffrey, is called The Conspiracy Farm. And the reason it's called that is because when you start to look into all of these topics, and automatically that term labels you, so <laughs> you're not really allowed to. Because then the second you – even one topic within the umbrella of anything that's considered a conspiracy, you automatically get thrown into this, this little box of people's perception. And so the first place to start is when you start looking down this road, a lot of people will get these little piece, bits of information that challenge the narrative. And they'll reel back because it's a very painful process of you're at this point where you've had this – indoctrination your whole life of what's real and what's not and what version of, of everything exists and when you see those those little moments that crack that fragile understanding i think it, it makes a lot of people really afraid it has to be a certain kind of person who really is strong enough and open-minded enough to be able to accept those ideas or at least ponder them it's the sign of a, a really intelligent person to be able to grasp and ponder an idea rather than just accepting it that's the true sign of someone being uh, an intellect is be is having the ability to take things that completely challenge their reality and just look at them just hold them up in this this little you know window and look at them objectively with nothing else around them and see if they connect and you know don't be afraid of reshaping your reality what are you afraid of i think people are afraid of the unknown and I got to just you know, fully admit that while I've always been interested in these types of topics, I never went searching for a predetermined narrative because I was already interested. Right. All of this was basically by accident. I just was curious about it. And it led me down a road that completely changed everything in my life. And mm -hmm. as Jeffrey was very kind enough to say at the beginning, he knows what that's like as well because once you start to really – put these things into perspective, it changes how you view yourself and everything that's happened in the past, right? Without a doubt. I mean, not to use that matrix metaphor, because you kind of schooled me on the red pill, but just that the, the analogy of, you know, taking something or coming into your mind, understanding something that just changes your whole paradigm and how you see everything. It's powerful stuff, folks, powerful stuff. All right, so let's let's get into this then. The, the first place that we need to start is with the oldest text we have. If we want to try to look at where we take evidence to place where every, everything begins, we would have to start with what I call the first Sumerians. Okay, And that's the, the difficult concept to wrap our heads around is that most of the ancient cultures around the world that became sophisticated are part of different epics that came and, and went. So when we... Like first off, for instance, let me give you an example. Um, I think it might be uh, the perception is that things like the ancient Egyptians um, sort of just slowly died out, and those more the the monuments they built and the things that they had 
just got incorporated into cultures and that was sort of how it it bled into our story but it's not really that way at all when the sphinx was first photographed in, along with the great pyramid of giza in the 1870s if you look at those black and white photos it was completely buried up to its neck in sand mm -hmm. okay and the pyramids had sand all over them and it was like the ancient those that period of egyptians what i call the dynastic pharaohs the dynastic Egyptians, the dynasties, these pharaohs that Tutankhamen and Ramses, they were part of a certain time period in Egypt. And that's the the entire story we get of Egypt is just this one little glimpse. And that glimpse is supposed supposedly around, you know, 4,000 years ago or so. This glimpse of Egypt, and that's everything, right? Everything was built by them. That's the entire story, but that's not the story at all. Right. There's a lot of conflicting information that's really coming out for these sites all around the world that is saying, look, that culture that's there that you think of that was existing at the, the most recent, you know, like 4,000 years ago, that that's only a culture that inherited that, those structures later. Yes. They didn't build them though. They're not responsible for building them. <clears throat> and that's how we begin this story of understanding, first of all, that there have been many different periods of time with different sophisticated civilizations that have risen and fallen. But every time they fell, they became less sophisticated over time. And that's where we are now. We're not at, we're not at the height of our civilization. I would argue that we've, we're sti we've still fallen to a point. Look, like what we, everything we just talked about, we live in an incredibly unbalanced world where we have no respect for our world or the, the universe. People walk around like there's not even anything above them. Right. It blows my mind on a dark night when people are just walking through cities with light pollution that they don't even perceive them themselves in a vast universe with billions of of galaxies and star systems. It blows my mind what we exist in now, but that's not what the ancients existed in. They right. they understood, Jeffrey, that we are this incredible conscious being of energy that is connected to everything and that our place is that of experiencing new things and um, pushing the limits of what's possible and investigating the mysterious and the unknown mm -hmm. to find answers. And before, the before you... we let you go too, I definitely want to talk to you about why that is. And the part that really blew my mind about your work is what they call the Eagle versus the serpent and how that war uh, is, is responsible for the direction of humanity and why we're seeing things the way we are right now. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And we, and we can definitely touch on those subjects. But the more you get to look at this stuff, the more you look at there's this great divide with how and what the Eagle Serpent essentially really represents is the mentality that a civilization will take on mm -hmm. and who will essentially control that narrative. And the Eagle is is not at all what we've been told in the Serpent and these other symbols like the Caduceus and even symbols like the swastika. All of these ancient symbols became corrupted mm. and inverted into their opposite meanings and we got we we don't want to go too far down that that road because we're going to try to stay on this on the timeline but um basically the way you got to look at it is a civilization can either be based on the acquisition of knowledge and understanding balance and growing on a energetic and conscious level and have this world that grows based on things that are that are sustainable or it can basically uh, be focused on war and materialism and this fake illusion of a world where the things that they do just sort of disappear because they can't take them with them. You know, like when someone buys everything possible and they fill their garage up and they're, they have all this stuff and they feel really happy and they die, all that stuff just gets thrown in the dump somewhere. And then it's, it's so amazing to me how, people have been conditioned into this materialistic viewpoint, which really that's the, what the symbol of the eagle represents is this idea of conquering in war and having this really linear viewpoint of having a, it's more of like a, an overwhelming masculine um, type of conquering mentality. Mm. And, and it, it, that doesn't get into, I'm not trying to say that it's this, um, that masculine and feminine is bad. It's just you have to have a balance of right, types of energy. Right. It's always about this balance of energy. And in many ways, the serpent represents this higher knowledge, 
balance with the earth, like I mentioned, and the stars, and those symbols became inverted, like a lot of these other ones over time. And that's why this version of history is so difficult to understand, because it's just built on the backs of these heroes that we think are heroes, but are, are really just these villains of empires that have controlled and dominated the message. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pull you off your timeline. I was going to, like I said, before we let you go, I meant to say, like, once yeah. your presentation done. But yeah, th- I mean, it all plays into the timeline still. But because it's, you know, the, the Enlil side that's deceiving us and all that. But go ahead, brother. Yeah, so let's get back to where we were before. We got off there on a tangent. Um, we have to start with the Sumerians because the Sumerians contain the oldest record that we have of the past. And we know that because this type of writing that the writing style they had that eventually became um, a dead language known as Sumerian cuneiform and later Akkadian, that style of writing was never replicated ever again. So if you look at today, how all of our records are digital or on paper, it would be very easy just to have some disaster occur and never, ever have those again. They'd be gone in just a couple hundred years, depending on the type of disaster. But on the other side, this culture was so incredibly sophisticated and had gone through so many cycles of these catastrophes, and we can get into what those are at some point. But they, they understood all of that, and so they, they etched their records into clay and then baked them in, into, these, into these incredible strong tablets that could withstand incredible fires. And one of the greatest libraries that was ever found was actually found in, um, in, in Nineveh, Iraq, called the Asher of Bonapal Library in 1849. And that was part of an ancient city that was burned to the ground. It was attacked by Babylon after Asher of Bonapal died, and they burned the entire city to the ground, just like the Library of Alexandria in, mm-hmm. in Egypt. But because cuneiform tablets are so strong and can, and can withhold um, so much trauma and disaster. Essentially, those those tablets were remained um, mostly intact. Some of them were definitely damaged, but because there was thirty thousand of them, hmm. there was quite a few of them were, that were, remained um, in at least enough of a state where you could translate them. Right. And that's where this whole entire story begins, because essentially. When George Smith, the only the first Assyriologist basically ever who learned this dead language that had been dead for thousands of years, when he first actually got a hold of them in the late 1800s up in Oxford, England, he couldn't believe what he was reading because he was reading this entire lost history of humanity. And that's where this timeline begins. And some of the tablets that have subsequently come out of that region, this region of the Fertile Crescent, where everything began al- along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, According to these tablets, like the Eridu Genesis, it states that human civilization began there, but not 6,000 years ago. Right. Well, and it's so it crazy, began. the volumes of cuneiform that they found, so few have been actually translated. They have so many, wherever they are, the Vatican or the British Library, wherever it is, that you know still are just waiting to be translated. Can you imagine the information to be extracted from that? Well, that's why it's so it's so easy to understand how this is a conspiracy if you actually have an open mind and you look at it, because it's so obvious that this these tablets and the information they contain does they don't want that to come out because it would completely redesign this narrative of our history. It, yeah, it's to me it's so um, ridiculous that this term myth, you know, the myth of Atana, the myth of Adapa, like. They they gave these names that automatically turned them into something that seems like it's not real. But yet all these tablets mention very specific cities, very specific places in that region that are in some some cases are still around today. So they you mentioned Atanya, is, just to qualify who that is. That's the yeah. uh, that the first king of the post diluvian flood world. Like after the flood came the deluge, the first uh, in the first city of Kish, Atanya was the first king of of that uh, civilization. If, I, if I'm correct, there. I like that. I'm you are quite the student, my friend. <laughs> I got a good that's, teacher, brother. <laughs> that's that's correct. And so when you 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 learn about these mythologies, it it says things like what Jeffrey just said that there was a king named Atana that was called the great architect after the great deluge, and that he was handed down this scepter from heaven in quotes from the gods to be the architect of the sheep the the new world so he would be their king and he says that kish was the very first city ever built after this set of disasters that we now can pinpoint 
in these different time periods that what look like cycles of every 12,000 years mm -hmm. destroyed everything in these regions and forced them to start over again. And they, they talk about that. They, they don't say in just these hypothetical terms, like a flood, like it's some kind of information um, metaphor or something like that. That's, that's not what it is at all. There are parables and there are, there are, there's sim symbolism built in that you have to figure out, yeah. but there's also a lot of literal truth. There's a lot of things that are meant in a literal way. Like when it mentions that a city was there in a certain time and ruled by a certain King, they're being literal. And so when you take those and you lay them out in a timeline, we start to get this completely different version of history. And the place you start is with the Sumerian king list. And that is another one of these cuneiform tablets that came out of the region of Iraq that points to these great kings of Sumer. That was the region was called long ago that when you add them all up, you get over 200,000 years ago. And that's completely mind blowing considering that our entire story is supposed to only be 6,000 years old. <laughs> right. That's the um, real game changer for me. I mean, many things are, but the Sumerian Kings is where, you know, it's literally translated that these Kings reign, not their lives, but their reign was like 20, 30, 40,000 years. Yeah. And you know, what's amazing. I don't know if anyone knows this. I don't, uh, I've, I think I've only briefly mentioned it, but there are a lot of those who've come along and have said they don't believe the ages in the Sumerian king list. And they said it, they say it's mistranslated, except that they don't understand that a shar was the time of the type of unit of measurement they used in these time periods, and it represented 3,600 years. And that number is mentioned in the Atrahasis. But what's amazing about that is the same type of list of different kings is also present in another tablet that most have never heard of called the Uruk King List. OK, and I want people to check that out. And in the Iraq king list, it's only a list of kings from that specific region. So it's not as extensive as the Sumerian king list, but it still lists these incredibly long reigns of the kings of Iraq and that city. It, the ruins that were built over and over again, the latest of those ruins is still around today. And that's what's so mind blowing about it, because all of a sudden these myths become these records of history. Right. And if you can separate out where those things belong and then take all the things that are supposed to be literal and all the things that are supposed to mean a certain thing and then try to plot them out, you get this incredible story of who we are that, like I said in the beginning, takes you on a journey that will completely redefine everything in your life. Yeah, exactly. And I don't want to pull you too much off the civilization, but it is, I mean, in, in the understanding of who these people are, people are, yes, they can manifest into physical beings, but ultimately these are, are, uh, they're engaging in like multidimensional travel. They're multidimensional beings. That's why you say, you know, these myths, you know, say Inky, for example, or Odin, why do these each incarnations have the trident? Well, these are the same myths being, uh, repeated, if you will, but these are the same entities moving in multidimensional fashions, if I'm correct on that. Yeah. Um, but but to add on to that, before we get that far, essentially what we need to understand is that these tablets don't state that it's it was just these random kings that decided to build cities and rule over them. It doesn't it doesn't say that it actually says things that are so fantastic to, for people to wrap their heads around that they've been immediately rejected by most of modern academia. Right. And that's where this all begins, because they really clearly state that there were beings that came here. They, that's what they say. And they're, and they're not representations of the planets or forces of nature. Those things do exist in the tablets. And that's one of the things I talk about in the first chapter of the, of the new book that we're writing is I mentioned how, for instance, let's take uh, a, a tablet like the Code of Hammurabi that came out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Hammurabi was a great king of Babylon that ruled during the post-Diluvian time period. And he states in it that Anu and Bel call by name me Hammurabi, right? And then at the end, he mentions Shamash, like ruling over the people like Shamash. And if someone was to look into Shamash, they would find that Shamash was like was the sun, essentially. Okay? But that doesn't mean that Anu and Bel were planets. No, in fact, Anu and Bel were just different names used. Bel was a different name used for Marduk who the city of Babylon was named after. And not only that, but when Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon, there's an entire text called 
in his name, in Cyrus the Great, who basically says that when he reached Babylon in fear, he had this conversation with the, the god of Babylon known as Bel or Marduk. He had conquered the city, and yet his greatest fear was this this god that had ruled the city in, in his name. And that's how you named after. And so these beings get into these great discussions about humanity and how they feel about us and why we were created and how they view us later on. And these discussions, the point I'm trying to make here is they're not trying to show like representations of how nature is, is, is viewing us and trying to figure out how things are changing over time. They're very specific conversations. They're talking about, you know, why we were created and our purpose here and, and the means for how we were created are so fantastic that they completely <laughs> make this um, a very clear, literal translation about, you know, where we came from. And they, they state that we came from these great creator gods that came here right. that were ancient, ancient, ancient beings, they state, that came here and they decided that because – there was too much labor to do to create a civilization and create the infrastructure here. They decided they want to create another, like a, like a laborer, like a worker. And it states in the Atrahasis and in the Enuma Elish that they essentially took this Neanderthal Denisovian hominid that was already here that was somewhat compatible. And they basically mixed in their DNA and they created this basically like an Anunnaki cross of, of what this primitive hominid was. And that's what we are. But, even though we share most of our DNA with other species on the planet, there's this entire section of our DNA called non-coding DNA that's that's not shared by any other species on our planet. And even though it only represents less than 10% of our DNA, sometimes those small amounts are the, have the biggest changes overall, Jeffrey. Mm. Yeah, talking to Billy a couple of years ago, he mentioned something about a gap in our chromosome map, like chromosome 9, or I forget the number, but... Yeah, it, it's very interesting. And ladies and gentlemen, I mean, if you're like a Christian and kind of having a tough time swallowing some of this, I mean, some of this is even mentioned in religious texts. In the book of Genesis, they talk about, you know, the Nephilim when giants roam the earth or, you know, kind of what you're describing, like us doing a little bit of there, there being some genetic splicing, you know, where they say the sons of God basically mated with the daughters of men. And that's essentially, you know, kind of what you're explaining there. Yeah, it, it says in Genesis that we were created in their image. It's it's always plural. It's the problem with that that is um, I'm not an atheist at all. Just for those who are right. wondering about that, that are religious, I'm I'm very spiritual, and I absolutely believe that there's so many signs. If you look at the the spiral of the golden spiral and all of the different Fibonacci numbers that have been discovered that prove this mathematical formula between um, a, an intelligent creator of mathematical properties of our universe. It's clear that all of this is designed. Mm -hmm. This everything here is designed as like this playground for the different types of dimensions to, to interact with the physical and non-physical. Yes. That's what all of this really is. And it's the idea of, okay, if you're a being that reaches a state of having awareness of its place in the universe and has the the ability to make decisions and create things because it's very smart, imagine what that story could look like. If all of these different things were pumped into that timeline to influence that being, and that's what's so incredible about this, is that the story of who we are and what we were supposed to be is not where we are now. It's it's far from it, right. and that's what makes this so difficult to to swallow, like you said, is because what they're saying basically destroys the entire viewpoint in every single um, point of what we've been told in, in every way about like defining consciousness, defining how, how far back civilizations go, defining, you know, what really makes up the universe. Is it, is it just energy is, or, or is it just physical changes? Yeah. And all those things, it's all part of a, this web that these ancient texts all throughout history are trying to point us in a certain direction. And we just need to listen. Well, and a part of that, you know, ever, expanding psyop which goes back centuries and i really don't mean this uh, disrespectfully i just think it's something that hinders us from realizing what we're talking about here i think religion has played a huge role in keeping people like fearful and you know more in that fear fight or flight mode of you know i, I just think it's it just keeps people i like to use the bruce lee metaphor bruce lee's like talking about you know be water um 
you know, he was talking about martial arts, but he was saying fixed positions solidified that which was once fluid, fixed positions and fighting. But I think religion does that. It has a plays a role of kind of keeping us in the box of our thought of like who we are and et cetera. But talking about what we're talking about, it's very hard for I think those guys to swallow it. But if they can kind of remove that that confirmation bias, if they will, and be able to see this information objectively, it's pretty clear <laughs> that you know. But yeah. but that's the that's the problem, Jeffrey. It, it's it's too difficult. It's difficult for a lot of people to get to that point. Right. To say, okay, I'm gonna ex- I'm gonna look into this objectively and actually put it on in a place where it's being measured, not just being considered for two seconds and then rejected. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, within certain things, specifically Christianity, like you know, just don't ask questions. Just be a good Christian. So if you start to question this. You might, you're not being a good Christian and you might even be worshiping the dark arts or sit, you know what I mean? It's like that mind yeah. screw, you know, the psyop that I think a lot of religion uh, manifest. People are scared. So even hitting them with this kind of camera is like, oh, nope, nope, you know, whatever. Well, and that's well, on them. for those people that aren't, you know, that are on the fence about that, we're, what we're talking about here, the ancients called the old religion. And it was part of a pure form of spirituality mm. that existed based on the values of the ancient past. And later, a lot of it became rewritten and, t- and turned yeah. into more of a controlling side, like you said. And it really doesn't allow open-minded thinking. It might have some good principles woven in. And I, Without I a doubt. Agree. Without a doubt. And I do not doubt that. You're absolutely right. But there's a lot of things that have been taken out and have been turned on their head. Like you said, this whole heaven and hell concept and Satan and all these all these aspects. Well, the ancients talk all about these different dimensions and these different aspects of our reality. They go into great detail and, and getting back in, into those. You know, why does our why does our timeline go 200,000 years? Is it just the Sumerian king list? Well, one of the things you brought up briefly is the idea that we can look at our genetics and we can look at the changes that have we've done as as homo sapiens over this time period and what we see especially if you look at um, people like lloyd pyre's work he's my favorite person who who studies you know human changes over time he's pointed out that this two hundred thousand year period that the sumerian king list just happens to add up to is when we find these sudden changes that occur in this timeline of us all of a sudden the human brain just jumps and we find that the structure, the skeletal structure changes and so many things change that it, it, it literally takes on a form that is very, very different than what we were before. And even though we're walking around basically, you know, naked without any hair or anything, and we don't have any means to survive here, people just immediately accept that we've just gotten there through these really primitive means. But but that's not what the tablets say. So anyway, these these beings create us, and they want us to be the physical laborers in this reality because they want to exist in these higher dimensions and just basically observe humanity and, and interact with us on these certain levels because that's the whole game for them. And they state in all their tablets, they lower kingship. They lower all the laws and the knowledge for how to create civilizations, and then these great civilizations emerge. And they worship these gods. They cre- they create temples over them, and they talk to them. And in all these tablets, they mention how these kings were talking to them and having discussions. And these, and every single time, it's like they're chosen to rule over this city because they have a certain kind of bloodline yeah, that gets back to like you said, where some of these great beings were able to to manifest physically here. They were physical beings at times, and they slept with the daughters of men, which is just what it says in. In the Bible, it talks mm. about how we essentially this Nephilim came about because it was this cross between these these angels that then became fallen angels, like it says in the book of Enoch. That's it's all the same thing. Right. It's all the same thing. It's these beings that broke. This is what what it is. They broke the laws of creation. They 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 call them the bounds of creation, and that's what they actually mention in these tablets and in other places. Um, such as the Bhagavad Gita and other places, it's there. They call it the bounds of creation, and you're not supposed to do certain things if you are a, like a powerful being. You're supposed to leave things alone and let things go the course they're supposed to go. And they and these 
Whatever these beings are, we have very little information for them other than after they came here. But they named, the name of them is based on the name of our Earth. Anunnaki, Ki, K-I, meant Earth, and Anu meant, it was the, the one who was in charge of things, and essentially Anunnaki meant those who from heaven to Earth came or those who Anu sent to Earth. It's always been about them coming here. And every ancient text from every civilization around the world that is old enough to have these records all says the same thing in essentially just different ways. And going along further in the timeline, you essentially find out that because of all this information and this knowledge, that civilization grew rapidly and turned into a, a, a great, sophisticated cult civilization around the world. It's not that there was just these little pockets, but I want to give you an example. If people want to study three places that are going to completely blow their mind, just three locations on Earth that prove all of this. Just look at Cusco, Peru. Look at the Osirion in Abidos, Egypt, and then look at Osaka, Japan, with the Imperial Palace Wall. If you look at those three locations and you look at the building style of those structures, they are completely identical in almost every way. The, the, the way that they form the blocks, the way that the structures are designed with the technology, the boreholes, the saw cuts – like Brian Forrester, one of my favorite researchers of all time, mm -hmm. who I've been working with recently, like he talks about, those things are all evident on these structures and they're all identical. And why I mentioned those three locations is not only because the work is identical in sophistication, but it's three corners of the world. Yeah. And that means that that technology and sophistication reached all the way around the world. And that's where this timeline starts to get plotted. Well, and those things right. are said to be, those megalithic structures are said to have been made with like Bronze Age tools, which is just, you know, completely impossible to even almost replicate it to now, let alone however long ago. That's, and that's the smoking gun, is for anybody who's on the fence about this, go look into what's known as the Mohs hardness scale, okay? And go look at the properties of these different tools during different time periods. Now, let's just say... For, for argument's sake, that the timeline we've been told in our history books is accurate. What they state about these locations, whether or not it's Bar Bar Hill Caves, uh, Alora Caves in India, Osaka, Japan, or looking at you know Petra Jordan and Baalbek, Lebanon, and all the way over to um, you know Ole Te Tombo and Cusco, Peru, whatever you want to do, any of these sites around the world, they state that they were built by you know, the Inca or, you know, the Egyptians, but they, but all of them state one thing. They say they were, they were built using bronze age tools because the timeline we're given has a certain linear progression of advancement. And in the time period that they place us, if we have this mindset we have now, it means that everything was more primitive in the past and it became more advanced later on a very linear view, yes. right? Just this boom. And so therefore they would say, well, if this fell in this time period, like we're told, then they had these tools available. That was as sophisticated as that culture was. And all of these sites around the world all fall into the same category that we're told. It was, it stated that they had bronze age tools like Jeffrey mentioned. Now, if you look at the Mohs hardness scale and you look at the materials that all of these sophisticated, what are known as megalithic civilizations, megalithic means very large stones. When they carved all these different places around the world and made these structures, it was almost always out of these very, very hard stones like granite or travertine or, or just these very, very high silica quartz stones that were very, very hard on the, on, the, on the Mohs hardness scale, way up, right? And those Bronze Age tools would have been impossible to be able to carve them. It would have been like taking a piece of plastic like we have today or just a very soft metal like aluminum or brass or something and trying to carve like a, a very hard rock. It would, you wouldn't be able to do anything. You could just sit and bang on it all day and it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't cut at all, let alone the precision on these cuts that is so advanced that we can't even do it with our technology today. That's the most mind boggling part of all of this. It's not that they didn't just have bronze age tools. They had technologies that we don't have. Their means of cutting these stones, Brian Forrester has pointed out one thing that is, is, is impossible to, um, to look past. When you go to places in Egypt and Peru, um, around actually Cairo 
and around um, the Osirion and in different places around the Great Pyramid, you find these boreholes around these ancient sites around the world. You find them in Peru as well. These holes that are like in Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, perfectly circular through the center of these rocks. Okay? So perfect that it was it's the only way you could do it is if you had like a bore diamond diamond di uh, bit bore drill. And but the problem is they've brought in expert masons that have gone to these ancient sites and looked at them and they don't even understand how it, it was possible, <laughs> right, to make some of these structures. So we're not talking about a civilization that was just had some fun little temples and, you know, looked at the stars a lot. We're talking about their ability and understanding of our world and energy centers and un understanding what really mattered and building these structures that had these energetic purposes that could bring them to probably everything from higher conscious states to connecting to these gods to in extending their life and making them live longer. When you look at the Osiris tomb in Egypt, there's this giant, giant granite box, right? It's not hollow. There's nothing in it, but it's this giant tomb, tomb that's a, a box, essentially. What was the purpose of carving this multi-ton box and then lowering it down to the subterranean cavern with incredibly sophisticated pillars and then placed it there? It's an energetic purpose. Mm. I, I believe that some of these beings, whether or not they're human or non, had the ability to literally go into like a stasis, like Thoth mentions from Egypt, where you literally go into like a stasis and you can reemerge. And we've seen that in a lot of movies. Yeah. Reemerge later, right? And I think that that's really what we're looking at here is completely lost understanding of any of all these things that were happening in our past that really like seem like they come right out of some <laughs> Lord of the Rings or science fiction novel, right? It's 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 almost fantastic to consider. Well, that's like in a modern day when you talk about it, like oh, you've watched too much, you know, Enter the Name, you know. And when you said that, getting a stasis, it reminds me of the opening of the X Men Apocalypse movie, just the story of like that particular character of Apocalypse. That was his deal, but yeah. I think that's where they took it from. I think that all a lot of movies have woven in a lot of this ancient stuff into them yeah. um, for, for various reasons, and they all point towards this p past history when all these abilities, longevity, all these different secrets, we, be, we lost all those gifts. We, we fell down to a lower state, and now we're just trying to find our way back. Yeah, and it's interesting going back to what we were mentioning a second ago, kind of, you know, stories that are in the Bible. It's all also very interesting that the fall of humanity came from, you know, the misrepresentation of the serpent and the, you know, the the tree of of uh good and evil, etc. And because we fell so hard, this begotten son had to be brought to save us and all of that stuff. I I I'm a big fan of Billy Carson obviously, but I think that that messianic kind of thought process as well, somebody's going to save me or something's going to save me. Is, it can be dangerous because honestly, you know, the, the true gifts and the true savior is is within us. I mean, not to talk corny about it, but that's that's the truth. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's, you mentioned it's actually really interesting in the secret book of John in the the, the Nag Hammadi. Um, one of the most incredible passages it talks about is the idea that this jealous creator God, who we know is named Enlil and Sumer. It's, he states that because he was put in charge of these different – they were put in charge of these different lots, they called them, or different dimensions or realms, that his was – he was in charge of our physical realm. And he mentions how he basically had almost like a hatred towards humanity because he felt – they felt threatened at, um, at what we could become. And his name yeah. in the text was Yaldabaoth, okay? And he states that basically – they, because of that jealousy and that hatred by some of them, they cast us down into the lowest form of all energy mm. of, of matter, basically in this lower state of energy that we don't belong in because of that jealousy. And that's why we're in a state now where we, we didn't used to exist that way at all. In fact, the place that we were going to go next after talking about these, um, the Sumerian king list in the timeline is we were going to you know, get into Atlantis and how that got started. Yes. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, and keeping, well, before we go into the Atlantis, it's just so interesting because you go back to that sibling rivalry, which has dictated the path uh, of humanity, Enlil versus Inki. Um, you, I'm watching, prepping for this, I listened to you and, uh, you and Billy's video. Talk to me a little bit about some of what you guys read about Ninlil. 
uh, it was a, a female human being that once she began, you know, courting with Enlil, they were speaking about able to control the fates. And to yeah, me, sure. that to okay. me that read about that read that their ability to dictate the path of humanity, which is like. I talk about it all the time. This eagle and the serpent thing has been dictating the path of humanity for centuries, if not longer. Talk to me about yeah. Enlil, if you don't mind, real quick. Okay, so the tablet you're referring to is called Enlil and Sud. Okay, and it's another one of these Mesopotamian tablets that came out of the Iraq area. And it talks about how Enlil, this great god of the mountain, he was known as the mountain of me, this, these temples he had built for him. He basically was searching the cosmos and everywhere to find this per, this perfect female consort, right? That's what it states. And in, of everywhere he searched, didn't matter. He ended up finding that consort as in a human here on Earth, and her, and, um, and her name was was Sued essentially. And she was she was the the daughter of another of a woman who lived in this region at the time. And he essentially goes and asks for this daughter that she's going to have um, hand in, in marrying him and becoming like a great ruler. And now the term that's in there you're referring to, that's so incredible to me. And it's, it's actually one of the subtitles of one of the chapters in um, one of the chapters in my the book, the stage of time. It's this concept in this term that's used in multiple tablets. I think I, I added up at least three tablets that mention this term. And every time I, I hear it, I try to con think about it and connect it. And what it says is that he he basically tells this um, this female, Ninlil, that he wants to make her as powerful as him so that she can be an ordainer of destinies. Okay, this is the term that it uses, and it uses it in many, many places. In fact, it references these Anunnaki or Anuna, as they call themselves, as the ordainers of destinies. But it doesn't just state that as like some, um, you know, symbolic thing. It actually talks about that in the Epic of Gilgamesh specifically, where he's Gilgamesh, this great king, okay, of Uruk, like we mentioned, the Uruk king list. Mm -hmm. um, he talks in that about how he got the the gods, these Anunnaki gods, connected with him and were having discussions and told him that basically he had greatness in his destiny. OK, they could basically what it implied when you read the whole tablet, all the whole sets of tablets, there's actually many, many tablets that make up the Epic, Epic of Gilgamesh. And I believe it's the longest set of tablets of all. That whole story, though, what you find out is that Gilgamesh is a, an ancient bloodline king who was very, very tall, had this adult lion as a pet it was the size of a house <laughs> cat. That's how big he was. Yeah. Right. It shows images in, in murals showing that. Yeah. But it says he went on this great journey to find immortality through this great flood hero, Zaya Sujur or Atrahasis. But what's so amazing about that is that he says that he was chosen by the gods because they perceive his destiny as being heroic. And he's got all this potential. And all these other tablets go keep mentioning that, that the Anuna, the Anunnaki, the ordainers of destinies, and he mentions to this Ninlil that she can become his consort and, and be an ordainer of destiny as well. And what does that mean? Well, in the same tablet and in another one also um, called the um, Enmakar and the Lord of Arata, it mentions that there's these specific types of temples that have these me's, M-E apostrophe S of magnificence, and they call the temples Iyanas. Okay, and so I started to like really think about this. And to think about what they what they talk about with ordainers of destinies. And the only thing that makes any logical sense when you consider any of this is that somehow these beings have the ability to perceive timelines. That's the only way that makes sense because when you read about Atlantis being destroyed, one of the things that comes up with um, like Ed Edgar Casey readings and, and other right. places as well is the idea that there were these crystals that had the ability to be incredibly powerful, and if used in the wrong way, they could destroy, have great power. Um, and that's, it's interesting to me that that, that name, Mies, apostrophe, I ended up finding that. I actually learned about that in other places. And then when I was reading these tablets, I found that again. I'm like, I, I couldn't believe that it was actually saying that in these texts. And so I do believe, as hard as it may be to accept, that... Um, 
you know, if every conclusion you rule out, then whatever remains has to be the the most logical thing. And that and that is that somehow these had to be some kind of a crystal technology to perceive things. Mm -hmm. And that really blows my mind to consider that, like I got back to the beginning when I said that humanity seems like it's almost like this theater show. That's why yeah. I called um, my last book, The Stage of Time. It seems like we're on this great stage where we're being observed and we're being influenced by so many different places. Like you mentioned, these symbols, Eagle and Serban, all these influences of conquering in war versus other influences of becoming higher conscious beings and connected to the stars. It seems like that back and forth and that struggle has come to define us. Yeah. But as we've gone along, it's essentially this this mentality of war and conquering and the eagle has overtaken our world and brought us to the point we're at today. It's so deep. And I, I know I can't keep you much longer because I definitely didn't want you to get into the, with your recent finds about Atlantis, but you mentioned something about the Atrahasis or the or Zaya Sutra. Again, this is another biblical reference to some degree because those stories are essentially the precursors of the story of Noah and the great flood. So um, yeah. Talk you to want me to speak about those? Or what did you mean by that? Well, no, I was just saying you, you brought that up. So when people, I, not a lot of people oh, okay. maybe who haven't listened before aren't familiar with Zaya Sutra, a.k.a. Atrahasis, which is essentially the story of the flood in the Bible with Noah. Yeah, But definitely exactly. jump, into your, uh, jump, into, jump into your finds on Atlantis, man, because I find this really, really fascinating. <laughs> okay, so so many people are fascinated by Atlantis. It is the most popular of all the lost civilization material, right? And for good reason. I mean, we have some really interesting records from a very credible person, you know. But just to me, what's amazing is that there's a lot of ancient texts that have been taken and brought into a lot of religions and are taken in a really serious way, right? But then things like with Plato, he's one of the greatest philosophers in history, and yet all of his – everything he talked about with Atlantis was considered a myth. In a, and it really reminds me of how these tablets were – considered as well it's it seemed that a lot of really smart people learned that it'd be very easy just to discredit things if you just call them a myth hmm. and then people wouldn't take them literally so or conspiracy what i found amazing what, what i found amazing jeffrey is when i started to really look into these stories and reading about them just like how i mentioned in cuneiform tablets that there's these nuggets that are very literal that have very descriptive purposes plato does the same thing and in two of his most famous writings, the Timaeus and the Critias, he gives these incredible descriptions of Atlantis. Now, how do we know it's not a myth? Well, he says in his writings that he got all this information from Solon, who traveled to Egypt in 590 BC. And Solon stayed in Egypt and he learned all about ancient records and he traveled back. And for those who don't know, Solon was an Athenian statesman and poet. OK, and uh, Plato was obviously another Athenian philosopher. So he brought this story back and let's pause it for a second. Where did where did he bring the story back from Egypt, where we know that the Library of Alexandria was one of the greatest libraries in the world that was burned down by the Romans, the eagle, right, hmm. that attacked them and destroyed their entire civilization. Well, it makes sense then that if Solon traveled to Egypt, it would have housed one of the greatest libraries at that time in the world. I think the two greatest libraries in the world that have ever been found are the areas of Egypt, um, some of the texts that have been burned that will never go back again. But at least there's other things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and pyramid texts, which, by the way, I include pyramid texts in the next book. I don't know if anyone's ever even heard of those. They're from Saqqara, Egypt. And then I um, essentially – that culture that had all those records contained this great story, but it wasn't a story that was from the recent past. It was an ancient story that had been carried down to the Egyptians, mm. and they gave great detail to Solon about this, this civilization they called Atlantis. Now, I'm going to read a couple passages from the Timaeus and Critias and describe Atlantis, and we're going to have to try to blow through this timeline because we don't have a lot of time left. <laughs> but we're going to do the best we can here because I know we sometimes things go off on a different direction. So in the Timaeus and Critias, Plato gives these really dis detailed descriptions about this ancient civilization. And what you find is the descriptions of it mimic a lot of this ancient technology we found in these megalithic civilizations around the world. And therefore, really what you conclude when you start looking at it from the timeline of what we have for information is that Atlantis fell into what we think of as these lost civilizations. And I think it emerged after 
um, the great Sumerian cities that are talked about in a lot of these tablets became really sophisticated. I think that's really what we're looking at. And let's let's, let's read some of the evidence so we can we can back that up. Go for it. Okay. So in in the, we're going to start with the Critias. This is a section that he says, and I want people to really think about this because it really blows this open because these ancient texts contain all these secrets. For the ocean there was at that time navigable, for in front of the mouth, which you Greeks call the Pillars of Hercules, there lay an island which was larger than Libya and Asia together, and it was possible for travelers of that time to cross it from the other islands, and from the islands to the whole of the continent, over against them which encompasses that variable ocean. For all that we have been here, lying within the mouth of which we speak, is evidently a having a narrow entrance, but that yonder is a real ocean, and the land surrounding it most rightly be called, in the fullest and truest sense, a continent. Now in this island of Atlantis, there existed a confederation of kings, of great and marvelous power, which held sway over all the island, and over many of the other islands also, in parts of its continent. I mean, wow, that is incredible. I mean, think about it. He mentions at the end that not only was Atlantis a, had series of islands, but it could be considered a continent. It was so huge. Right. right. And that at the end, he, um, there were these great king, great and marvelous kings with great power, great power that yeah. ruled over the city. It sounds just like something out of a cuneiform tablet, doesn't it, Jeffrey? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I just, and I've, I've always been fascinated by, by Solon's depiction of it because, I mean, it's almost one of the only ones that really. Um, you know, of, of any substance kind of legitimize and, you know, kind of authenticate something. But something, uh, when I talked to Billy a while ago, and I think you even touched on it, I mean, we could think of, you know, Atlantis as a continent in the Atlantic Ocean, but Billy said something very, and I think, again, you echoed it, Atlantis was a global, it was like, it was a global phenomenon or global, yeah, something global as opposed to any particular localized area. But I, I do believe there was something something there and something you said so many times when you know you're in Maine so back in the day pre-diluvian there were miles of ice over where you're at and most of the you know North American continent and just the northern part of the world so I mean anything that might have been there could have easily just been ground down over hundreds of thousands of years of well, having ice on top of it yeah absolutely but what I need to I want to clarify a few things I'm not I'm not trying to um, state that Atlantis was just um, when it's referred to Atlantis, it was just that place. Right. It was definitely part of a, an, enor an enormous civilization that connected all over the world. I think that um, what we're talking about is a global civilization that existed around the world already, and we get evidence of that I'm going to bring up and we're going to talk about in a second from the Critias. But it, it doesn't state that Atlantis was the only civilization at the time. It actually doesn't say that at all. It says that the Mediterranean had a thriving civilizations, and so did Atlantis. So we're talking about a world in a way where today think about how people are connected all around the world, but there are empires right. Right, that exist. I think it's the same thing. Mm. Think of Atlantis as like the D.C. of the Atlantic Ocean, right? Right. <laughs> right. It was like the Washington D.C. of the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. It was like this giant set of circular island land masses, and we're going to read what it says about that. But it's it states that it basically got destroyed and. Um, well, let's get into it, and we'll and we'll expand on that in a second. So let me expand sure. on a couple things that Plato says in, in the Critias, because in the Critias is really where he gets into some of the hard details. Okay, it states that Poseidon carved the mountain where his love dwelt in a palace and enclosed it with three circular moats of increasing width, varying from one to three stadia, and separated by rings of land proportional in size. The Atlanteans then built bridges northward from the mountain, making a route to the rest of the island. They dug a great canal to the sea, and alongside the bridges carved tunnels into the rings of rocks so that ships could pass into the city around the mountain. They carved docks from the rock walls of the moats. Every passage of the city was guarded by gates and towers, and a wall surrounded each ring of the city. The walls were constructed of red, white, and black rock, I mean, that to me is completely mind blowing. Right. Um, it it it's not hypothetical. It's not just talking about this perfect society, this Socratic society. 
it's talking about a very specific place that Solon found all of this, these incredible descriptions about in Egypt. Okay. Now I want to get into something really quick before we, I read the last passage from the Critias. Go for it. Plato goes on to state that it wasn't like I mentioned before, he says that Atlantis before it was destroyed was part of an enormous war. Now, a lot of people have asked me, they've been like, you know, Matt, what are the evidence of, of wars in the past? Well, Plato talks all about this war that existed with Atlantis. And that war, almost everyone has heard of. Okay? And it's called the Titans versus the Olympians. Hmm. Okay? And it makes complete sense if you think about it for a minute. What was the Mediterranean area? What, what was that civilization that was there? The ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. Not the Greeks that we think of, but the ancient Greeks before them. Greece is just the Greek people in the Greek land, that area, that region, is part of an ancient place that connects to megalithic stuff. Like, for instance, in the Mediterranean Ocean, there's an island off of, there's a set of islands actually, off of Spain called Menorca. Okay. And on those islands are these incredible T shaped pillars that exactly mimic, in every way, the astronomical temple of Gobekli Tepe over a thousand miles away east in Turkey. Mm. The same astronomical temple. And you, what you find is that all of those cultures around the Mediterranean were all part of one empire. And then, and then this culture of Atlantis that was a continent off of this, the west of the Straits of Gibraltar. I do believe that it was part of that Atlantic Ridge area with like the Azores and right. possibly connecting all the way over to the area of the Bahamas. Maybe we had crust shift and move things around, but it seems like that entire region was part of something that used to be there. But it states that there used to be a continent there and it was a great empire that was the greatest the world had ever seen. They, it, was, it was basically, if you think about all the technology that had ever been developed by every culture in this entire 200,000 year timeline, Atlantis had reached the greatest level of sophistication of all. Mm. And that's what led to their own destruction as well. It's a glimpse back into looking at our own society because Plato says that this war was between Atlantis and the Mediterranean Greeks, and it was called the Titans versus the Olympians. And the Titans were was Atlantis, and the Olympians was was the Greeks. Now think about it for a minute. Where is Mount Olympus? Right. It's in, in Greece. Okay, that's the, the domain of Enlil. Okay, that was Enlil on the side of the Greeks. They were the Olympians versus Enki on the side of the, the Atlantis. But wait a minute, Matt. Didn't you say the Atlanteans were the ones who became corrupted? That's right. So then why are they on the, the wrong side? Well, Atlantis became greatly divided. And Thoth tells us that in the Emerald Tablets. He says that Atlantis became completely divided. There was a group there that he says delved into dark, dark magic, black magic, and started getting to all kinds of, of dark black magic and deep energy and all these things that were really um, completely the opposite of their values. And Atlantis became this very divided place. And <laughs> so what happened was, what happened was Thoth and a lot of the priests of Atlantis they fled before any of the of the war and any of the this, when the Atlantis sunk and disappeared because they knew that the entire it was all corrupted and they had to preserve all of that ancient knowledge from the past and that's how Egypt first got started. They he traveled there and he created what was known as Chem or Kemet, the land of Chem, and that's where the he states that he built the pyramids with all this ancient Atlantean technology. So there, that's where we we can place that Jeffrey. Based on this evidence, somewhere around fifty thousand years ago. Well, and again, we see these structures. You know, Thoth fled to Central America, Mexico area, and we see those megalithic structures there, where you know the, the emerald tablets reside or were written. It's um, so fascinating. Wow, I swear. Yeah, you make my brain hurt, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's let's get, before we get off too far. Let's read the last quote that Plato says, and this gives us evidence for what happened to it. Okay. Um, now, after these, when these wars were occurring, Plato states that Atlantis was destroyed from, from activities that were not related to the war. Okay. So 
even though Atlantis caused its own demise, it was because they they used their powers for the wrong reasons. And they used these certain types of knees, I believe, like it states, to create as like energy weapons or something. They they used it all for, for dark purposes and they caused basically their own destruction because they were located on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And during this time period, it happened to coincide with major Earth changes. And so what Plato states is that they essentially destroyed themselves by their own use of energy as well as these earth changes that they may have enhanced or whatever had happened at the time. But this is what he states. But afterwards, there occurred violent earthquakes and floods. And in a single day and night of misfortune, all of your warlike men in a body sank into the earth. And the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared in the depths of the sea. For which reason the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable, because there is a shoal of mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. Hmm. So he says right there that Atlantis was basically submerged beneath the ocean, and the entire civilization was destroyed. Now, the only thing that can, that can do that is when you get abs- um, tectonic plates that move across each other and one of them goes underneath another one. They they go right underneath and they cause incredible friction and earthquakes and violent um, disasters. And that's exactly what he says. He says, afterwards, violent earthquakes and floods. Right. You do so that for tens looking... of thousands of years, you're not going to see much. Yeah, so we're talking about an ancient time period and all of that, most of that evidence, I should say, is gone now out there. And you just have these little remnants of islands and and various things. Um, But it really is fascinating that all these things are like very clearly discussed by him in these texts. And yet we choose to just consider them as myth and and nothing at all at all. And it's it really really blows my mind when I read these and I try to wrap this timeline together. Now, quickly, Jeffrey, let's try to get to the end of this if we can. Absolutely, sir. I don't think we're going to be able to go go into detail, but think about all of these lost civilizations like the pre-Inca, right? And some of the ones you mentioned up the Mexico, like the early Aztec and the early Maya. We find this construction on the lowest levels that's sophisticated, and it gets more primitive as it goes along. And so what we can really do is, is any – is place any one of those sophisticated structured civilizations around the world that uses a certain level of sophistication, we essentially can all place them all before this these great catastrophes of the Younger Dryas 12,000 years ago because we know that they were around before them because all of their remnants were destroyed, scattered all over the place. They're always in ruin. And then a culture came later and rebuilt on top of them. And so really what we're talking about is these epics that seem to go – you know, he, mankind is created 2,000 years ago or around there, 200,000 years ago, and the city of Eridu is the is basically considered the biblical Eden. And then um, basically civilization rose and fall based on great empires fighting and these natural disasters based on the uh, grand solar and changes to our sun and mm-hmm. different astronomical things that are occurring. And so we see cycles going up and down, and these civilizations are basically – all placed where they are in this timeline based on what is said in these tablets and what little bits of evidence we actually have. Like, for instance, you mentioned Atrahasis in the Great Flood. Well, he talks about that Great Flood, but which flood? Could it have been another cycle before the Younger Dryas? Yeah, I could definitely accept that, especially when you look at some of the work Robert Schock and Robert Bavall talking yeah. about how the the Great Sphinx has astronomical um, connections that – may bring a, another processional cycle even further back. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's 36,000 years old. It, we don't really fully know, but we at least know that it falls into this enormous timeline that goes you know, well over 50,000 years in, in our past. And all these later cultures, like the Romans and the later Greeks, and looking at um, you know, modern day times, that's just this little tiny little glimpse that really does only go back um, about 6,000 years from, from what we're told. Well, but so, through, through, through some of that work, I was going to bring up Robert Schock and Robert Bavall earlier, as well as the late John Anthony West, because of being able to study these certain climate cycles, they've been able to see through the geology and the, the weather erosion or the water erosion on the Sphinx, they were able to push the date back way 
further than the official date. So, I mean, that's some of the, you know, the awesome research that those guys have done utilizing not just ice core like Randall, but, you know, just climate cycles. Yeah, that's that's what's so fantastic about this kind of work. I, I, I love geology. I love studying the climate. I've always had a fascination about that. And so I really dug into it and just and looked into their work and I dug into the data myself. And it's so clear that if you have extreme rainfall on a, a structure like the great that like the, the enclosure of the Sphinx, that you would have to look for a time period where enough rain was able to fall to create that erosion. It's as simple as that. Yeah. You just have to have an understanding of different time periods and weather patterns. And you can't say that rainfall eroded the, the enclosure of the Sphinx less than 6,000 years ago if there's never been a time period where really <laughs> much rain uh, at all yeah, fell. Exactly. So it's it's very clear. We It's not just that we're placing these items there because – on this timeline because you know it it sounds good we're using all this concrete evidence i really do believe that that points to the fact that you know we may not know exactly when they were built but we have a pretty good idea that it was well beyond 12,000 years yeah, we ago. know when they weren't that's for sure it definitely wasn't exactly. 2500 I, bc for the pharaoh khufu Exactly. I mean, Khufu, the, the great pyramid of giza is called khufu's pyramid by modern academics all to give Khufu credit for building it, even though Khufu is one of the dynastic pharaohs who came thousands of years later and had no part in <laughs> building that at all. Okay, They say that the pyramids were built by those pharaohs because there were tombs for them, except there's never been tombs from pharaohs ever found in those pyramids. And they were found over 400 miles away yeah. in the Valley of the Kings. I mean, it's just lie after lie put on top of each other. And then they just put a Band-Aid over and then tell people that's what they should just believe. And it just doesn't make any sense when you start to look into it. And I think that that's the unfortunate thing, Jeffrey, is that what separates individuals like you and I and a lot of the other ones that study this is that it's not that they go cuckoo and start having this weird mindset. It's that once you start going down this rabbit hole, I really love that term because it, it's, it's yeah. the best way to describe it. The one, once you start looking – it just keeps going and it connects to more and more things. And that's why individuals that have, you know, are, have a much more, a better understanding of this type of information to study this, it feel, it almost seems like they're just light distances away from other people that come up on the street because there's mm -hmm. that paradigm. There's yeah. that moment where people either have taken in just the narrative or they've gone the complete other way. And that's what we're that's what we're faced with today. Yeah, the confirmation bias. Well, brother, I've kept you longer than uh, I think you said you had time for tonight. Uh, any closing statements, comments? Uh, to... Yeah, actually, um, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate these conversations, Jeffrey. You're a, a fantastic person to talk to. Thank you, um, sir. And I really do love your enthusiasm and all the kind words and support you give me. Um, I just wanted to make uh, one announcement that I didn't get a chance to at the beginning of the show. There's going to be a lot of people that are really excited about this. Um, this has been the, one of the most commonly asked things um, of me in the last couple of years. And I just want people to know that I am preparing in the next um, coming weeks. I will be both releasing the second edition of The Stage of Time, well as the full audio nice. that was done professionally of The Stage of Time. And that is over seven hours long for all those people who say, Come on, Matt. I, like, I love your book, and I just I don't really like I don't really read that often. For all those people that have long drives and really prefer audio, you get seven plus hours of all of that. So I hope people enjoy that. I'll be re releasing those in conjunction, um, somewhat in soon in the future, and then updating my website with all the information. That is absolutely awesome. I'm telling you, the stage of time, ladies and gentlemen. He, a life's work. I'm sure. I mean, it just is that red pill. The information is just so mind blowing. It, it really goes more in depth than what we've gone on into here. The stage of time.com. Of course, the Epic of humanity with him and Billy Carson coming out very soon. Matthew, I so appreciate you, man. I so appreciate that. I mean, countless hundreds of thousands of hours that you put into doing this. Cause this is what we need, man. We need to like break out of the box. And like I said, anytime I talk to you, it's that breath of fresh air. It helps gives me that perspective of not getting so caught up in the moment to moment and realize you know, it makes me, you know, echo your sentiments of who we really are. And, you know, I don't get so caught up in our life situation, but our life is, you know, we are just glorious, you know, infinite consciousness with love on our mind. And, um, yeah, I appreciate your work, man. 
I really appreciate all those kind words. And I just want to just uh, leave off by telling people that I'm very opt optimistic about our future. As much as I put down, you know, what we are and what we're doing now, I am really optimistic about our future. There's so many other people like you that are that are discovering this information and changing on a fundamental level. I'm so proud of so many of the comments that I receive of people that just talk about how they've discussed this with others and you know blown their mind and completely changed them and it's just this chain the cycle of consciousness that's rippling out from our actions and causing this great paradigm change as we lean into this light of aquarius yeah. that the ancients always knew that these cycles have a, a positive and a negative polarity and we're going into that great time of positivity in the golden age and i think that it's really an honor to work with individuals like you who we can help to usher in that new age. Well, you know, again, I, I, can, I appreciate you. And we're not going to be a big pat on the bat fest, but it's like we're all works in progress. And I'm just indicative of that as well. So finding new information, not creating those confirmation biases where I'm not willing to hear new thoughts, new paradigms has really helped me out. And, you know, with the show I do, with the nature of it, it can just get dark sometimes. So I thank you so much because I'm, I'm just it's helped me create that balance of studying the darkness and kind of being immersed in the darkness while still staying in the light. So I know that might sound corny, but it, it's helped me more than I can begin to tell you. So it's always awesome to talk to you, sir. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I really look forward to the next time, too, Jeffrey. Absolutely. Matthew LaCroix, ladies and gentlemen, thestageoftime.com, the illusion of us, and the upcoming epic of humanity with Billy Carson. Peace and so much love, you guys. Stay tuned. As always, there will be more. <laughs>